Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 16th of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, which happens to line up with October, we're on the 28th, for the Gregorian calendar of 2023. And we are continuing in our reading of Genesis or Bereshit, chapter 22. Bereshit, if you remember, is in the beginning, be Rashid, right? Which is what Genesis, the beginnings of things, right, means in Greek. But anyways, just a little bit of a recap. Abraham called out from his the land of captivity, Ur of the Kazdim, has been obedient to the truth from his youth, has not worshipped the idols like his fathers and turned from that, left his own, renounced everything to, to follow after the one who called him as a type and picture of every believer, right? And now, after believing in the promises for a long time, but not always walking after the things of the Ruach, but according to the flesh, with the first covenant believers represented in Hagar and Yishmael, right? And now he's had the promised seed in the fullness of time after being made perfect himself in his old age, and circumcised according to the covenant, the physical representing the spiritual. Then he had the promised seed, who was the first according to the law, to be circumcised correctly on the eighth day. And all of that was following appointed times as we went over last time. And we'll see that even more clearly when we go through the book of Yobelim again, as we're reading chronologically here. Now, the thing about this one, there's something to do with inversion. It happens quite a bit in the scriptures where the, the stories or the narratives of the old covenant or original covenant would be kind of flipped around after he came. While it still is the same theme, it's kind of backwards. When you had the 12 sell generally it was all the brothers against one beforehand and then it was one against our mashiach out of the 12 although all turned and fled right <clears throat> in this instance and there's a quite a few of the things where the narratives are flipped around another example that's easy to see is right before the advent of our mashiach as that fourth branch like the shemesh the servant branch of the menorah where that's where everything would flip around and you have things going back. When you look at it like man started in the garden walking with the voice of Yahuwah, and at the end, man will be in the garden walking with the voice of Yahuwah. And all the things that happened leading up to the point of when he came is going to be reversed until we get back to that stage, right? That's one of these inversions, if you will. After the flood, or there was the rise of world dominion then the confusion and spreading out of nations where everyone was doing things uh, they all had their own little kingdoms and monarchies the people were called out from that right they coalesced to make their own government but they joined and have a monarchy like the, what, the rest of the world however they started with popular government and then it went on to his freedom or they went to the babylonian captivity came back out of monarchy with governors right and then it was placed under the rule of king priests then our they lost that it was given over to edom having dominion and then our mashiach came after that edom was given dominion spiritual edom and then you have king priests ruling again but these ones are not approved by our maker if you will the kohen uh Melakim with the, the Maccabees, who were literally of the seed of Louis or Levi, if you will, of the sons of Zadok, of the first order. I think it's Ab, Ab um, uh, what is it? Yahuwah, Ra, uh, Yahuwah will contend, I believe, is the meaning of the name, but is the first order of Kohanim in the in the complete works of Yahusuf, Josephus's 
War of the Yahudim and Antiquities. In his autobiography, he mentions that he's a descendant of the Maccabees, not the ruling ones, but Yahu Nathan. Shimon's children end up being the, the rulers, but Yahu Nathan was, was before him, then he took over after Yahu Nathan was killed. His sons were later on, Josephus was a descendant of his. But um, they were approved by our maker. They had their prayers answered. They they were doing things in the right way, although there is some contention with the coming of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the faction that came up. It, when you read about the stuff that they're saying, one of the chronology, the lines of thought there is that when Yahoo Nathan accepted the high Kohen position at the delegation of a foreign ruler, that was contrary to the Torah. And when that happened, there was a group of people that left and went off into the wilderness or continued in the wilderness from that time that became what we know as the, what they call the Essenes or the, the community at Qumran that eventually formed as there was more and more corruption with the people in the cities. But all of that leading to his advent, again, these are things that are cyclical, history that repeats itself that's hidden. But my point was the inversions. So while you have kings in Kohanim that are rulers over the people right before he came that were a good thing, you had kings in Kohanim over them afterwards that were not, right? When you had at the coming out of Babel, the fall of monarchy and the rise of popular government, that, that same thing repeated when you had the mystery Babylon coming out of that with the Reformation and then leading to the popular governments of America. But in that same vein, you have the continuation from when he came of that monarchy that was being broken up and then going from monarchy to popular government and then from popular government to everyone doing what's right in their own eyes, like the time of judges, Re regression back to that point. And then after that, you have this coalescement of a one world order type Nimrod thing, and then a breaking up and eventually a, a return back to the garden kind of state. So that's the inversion that you see. I'm ob willing. I, that makes sense to you guys and everyone that's listening. There is a lot more involved with that kind of thing. Lots of nuances. And it's not it's not always exact, but you can see them as directly contrary from what happened before to what happened later, but it's the same theme. And that's that inversion kind of thing that I'm just mentioning. It is not the way all things work in scripture. It is not the way all foretellings work. You have multiple different ways that he points things out. There's parables in the narratives of the, of the stories themselves. When you just take the, the plain events that happen, the meanings of the names of these peoples, and you just put it together in a childlike manner, it's a parable that tells a story about the truth. When you look at the parables literally in the creation account and the meanings of them, it tells you all of his works through history. When you look at the parables of the feasts, the festivals, and how it's walked out in history, you can see the, the events of the, the appointed times and what's going on with his people at these things that are that are happening until he returns and you can do the same thing with the animal apocalypses and the other parables and things that he gives you to know the future when you put them all together and you just take it for what he says that's when clarity comes right and that's all i'm trying to show you here although when you take it little by little or if, if you don't know these things and it's not familiar to you it can seem like it's a lot and it can be a little overwhelming you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. If you're not familiar with these things, the best thing I can suggest to you, go along with what I'm doing here, but just read the scriptures. Read the, the common scriptures that is available to everyone, right? What they call the Bible. And when you're familiar with that, he will show you these things. I, I, I guarantee that happens. It's exactly what happened to me, and I'm not special. I literally just read the Bible. I was doing what he said. And I called the Bible as opposed to the scriptures because the Biblia, the Biblia Ridian is the little book of Revelation 
that was going to be translated that colon that was actually pointing out the Wycliffe translation of 1390 of what we call the Bible. And that's where that word comes from. While yes, Biblios was the name of a false pagan mighty one, Biblia, Biblios, and Gamar, or Gabal, I think it's Gabal, Jabal. The name of the city is the paper or the, the materials they used to write with. But um, it doesn't change the facts that that is literally true and what happened. If you remember, our Mashiach was flailed. He was abused and mistreated. He was made unrecognizable as a man and presented and paraded before the people in mockery by Rome before being impaled. That is what they did with the truth. So what we have as the scriptures, we have to acknowledge that's the truth. This is what they did to his words. And when you take that, it's easier to comprehend that some things might be confusing and might not always be in the right order, or there might be some things that have what seem to be discrepancies. All of that is easily taken care of when you just follow his simple rules. Two or three witnesses establish every matter and examine the matters that differ to be sincere and not stumbling until the coming of Mashiach. Right? Trust in Yahuwah to lead you into all truth and do his will. When you walk in love, you know that you walk with him, and he, knowing the mind of the one he is dwelling with, will make himself known to you. He is comprehension. He is chokmah. He is the ability to, to get these things, and it's the doing of them that brings comprehension, just like it says. All right, so back on point. This is another one of those kind of inverted events where he already had the tabernacles. He had the third day of the 15th month was the birth of Yitzhak, and then he kept the Feast of Sukkot, if you will, to rejoice at the deliverance or the, uh, the fulfillment of the promised seed being with him in the land. But now after those things, he's offering him up at the Pesach. And you'll find out this is during the Passover. And that's when that was first instituted more clearly when you read the book of Yobelim. But this is another one of the events where it happens last, but it's the first, it's the previous feast day. And it actually is uh, walked out in his body as one of the first events with the exodus with his children. So that's another one of those inversions. But you see it all in the original covenant times to teach us that these things happen. Okay. Another example of that is that there are some things in the book of Revelation that are out of chronological order. He explains it in there by saying, you'll be, be careful that you're not caught as a thief or you're not deceived like a thief and they come as a thief in the night to you. In both places those are mentioned, there's events that are not in chronological order in Revelation. And you can actually find that phenomenon previously in Scripture. It, whether it was intentional or not, there's things that are out of order. And we know these as facts. The Yechezkiel, or the book of Ezekiel, if you look at the dates of when he was given visions, they are not in chronological order. The book of Daniel, the same thing. Events that happened in the time of Judges, okay? there There's a few things that are not like that to teach us that it would happen later on. There's nothing that whatever has been will be. There's also examples we have in Scripture of, like the book of Yahudith, for example, uses code words or it uses the wrong titles and names for the antagonists. It mentions, I believe, Assyria instead of Babylon, who was the offensive party at the time, or, and, um, or no, 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 it might have mentioned Babylon instead of the Greeks, which was the offensive party. But there's a few instances where that happens. Another example is in the Maccabees, where they give you the different names for a story that happened in a different part of the chronological, chronological order, but it was right there. So these things are showing the truth kind of got mangled 
just like our Mashiach made unrecognizable, but it's a pattern that repeated. So, Ab willing, you can see, and the, don't just take my word for it. Note these things and then confirm them as you can. The more you see these things as a fact, the more it's easier for you to comprehend it yourself. So back on point, this is one of those inversions. Oh, excuse me one moment. I got to pause and quiet my dogs. All right, so sorry about my dogs barking if that came on. They're quiet now. And we will go ahead and start reading here after we've covered all those things that we talked about. So we are on Bereshit or Genesis chapter 22. This is, and it came to be after these events that Elohim tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And I don't want to do this too much right off the bat, but I do want to show you something I found in this particular verse right here that I thought was interesting. Just the way it's translated in the English and what it actually says um, aren't exactly in line, right? But Wayahi, and it says, and it came to be, right? That That's normal. Achar hadebarim, after it says things, but hadebarim is the matters, literally, the matters. Ha'ela, ha'ela. This one is the interesting one. If you look at this word, Aleph Lamed He, and go through all the different Strong's numbers they have for it, it's translated in quite a variety of ways. And I don't want to go into all of them right here, but it means everything from to wail, like to, to cry out and to wail. It means Elohim. And it can mean like what you see here. Former, these, others, right? It, it, the idea of these ones or in connection to them. And I wanted to show you really quick how they can get some of that. We're not going to go into all of the meanings, right? But Aleph Lamed is L. It's like where we get the word for L, our creator. It also, when pronounced like this with the Sere, it's L. It means to or toward. When it says, Wa Yamar, uh, Yamar Elohim El Moshe, it says, and he, he spoke Elohim to Moshe, right? So when you have it to He or to Lamed He, because when you see a dot in the middle of most of these words or letters in the in the middle of a word, that is doubling the letter. Not always, but it, it does in most instances. Where you get the English where it doubles a consonant, like middle, biddle, dribble, running, sunning, swimming. You have that doubling. That's the phenomenon you see here. So this could be toward, unto, and then hey, the lamed is like a, a shepherd's staff to push, pull, go, teach, and learn. And hey is literally, the letter is like the rays of light through a window. It means what is revealed or made evident. At the end of a word, it means her. Um, she, as in the substance of things, the earth is a, a her too. We dwell in her, right? But to make evident is what these are. Literally, to reveal is the essence of what these as a word means. These, and you're pointing something out. So, ob willing, you can see how that connection means this word pretty simple. Every one of the meanings of this word that you can go through can be broken down with what it means okay and it's an interesting thing a terebinth or an oak how does that relate to l was an oak ever worshipped well yeah they were, had oaks and groves where they did a whole bunch of worship and service to ella 
And these are where these things come from. It was inherent in the language that they paganized, right? It's also an oath. But if you notice, Allah, an oath. Elah, Elah, a terebinth. Allah, Elah, all right, Elah, a terebinth. And then Allah, Allah, or Allah, Allah, right? Allah. They say L with an E L there, but that's a pathak. Okay. It's an A. Ah. A. Ah. La. Okay. I found this on the web for they say Ella with an L there, but that's a pathak. Okay. It's an app. Sorry about that. The computer. I really need to turn that thing off. Anyways, my point is while it's the same spelling, every one of these is spelled Aleph, Lamed, Hey, you have different pronunciations. Some of them double the Lamed, some of them do not. Some of them have an A vowel, some of them have an E, as we comprehend it in the English. In reality, A and E vowels are all from the Aleph or the Ayan. There's, it doesn't quite work in the sense that English does, but that's where it comes from. So the pronunciation dictates the meaning. However, you can put the vowels there to change the meaning that would change a word. And that is a deception that you have to be careful of when you're reading scripture. They do that very thing in, <clears throat> in the section where it says, and they pierced my hands and my feet in Psalm 22. When you look at the Masoretic text, they use the vowel points for it to say, and a lion at my hands and feet. So they actually change the wording there. There's a few places where they do that, and um, it's not even hidden. They write about it. It's in scholarly works, and everyone talks about it. The fact that they put the vowel points for Adonai, where it should say Elohim, or um, where it has his, the name of Yahuwah, they'll put the vowel points for a different word. But that's not the important part right here. Right here. You can see the simple meanings of the words when you go and you look at the dictionary like we covered and you look at what a word means, you can you can figure it out based on what's there. All right. But to go back. The whole section of chapter 22 here, I just want to do that first verse real quick and show you. It says, and it came to pass. After that, Acher and then Hadebarim, Had, that's Had Devrim, right? Or Hadevarim. But this is the words or the matters. So after the matters, the these or the unto what is made evident, right? But the these is like this. But after these things, right, and the Elohim, it says that Elohim, they use that as the conjunction, which the wa can be any type of conjunctive word, and, so, but, even so, thus also, whatever you use as a conjunction is the wa. And then you have ha Elohim. This is literally the Elohim. This word is used in the beginning, and it's almost always, I've found, when it's talking about the Elohim, it's the Father and the Son. When they're talking amongst each other, they say, let's go down and do this, or let's go see that. It's the Father talking to his Son, or it's the two together. Ha Elohim. Whether or not it's consistent, we see throughout the rest of the text. But this is never translated as the Elohim that I'm familiar with, all right? Nisha, is, they, they say this Nisa is tested, but that noon Samic is a providential event, a, a, a miracle or a banner. If you have a hay at the end, a providential event, a miracle or a banner that's made evident is a test. 
And I want to see if you can see that real quick. We can go to just the noon psalmic by itself. See, a standard, an ensign, a signal, or a sign. All right. The Yahuwah is my Nisi. Yahuwah Nisi is Yahuwah is my banner. Right. And if you remember, the banner over me, Song of Psalms, is love. The serpent upon the standard was upon the noon psalmic, the one to which when everyone looked by the will of the, by the word of Yahuwah to look upon that sign, they were healed. Right. So just to get an idea, you can see there's a lot more in these words than just what you might see in an English translation. And that's why I recommend to you to do this very thing. Look at these words and look at how it's written so you can see there's a lot of stuff that we might be missing in the English. This test was a providential event or a miracle. It was a sign and the banner over his people. Also, trying him, right? And then if you remember, Aleph Tau is our Mashiach. It's in front of everything that is his. So when you keep that in mind as we're going through here, you're going to see that there's quite a bit of stuff that's pointing out um, events. I don't want to read it, or I'm not going to point it out specifically. I'm not going to go into detail myself. But as we go through this, keep in mind, this is a parable about the Passover, the offering of the promised seed, who is the one that was perfect in his generations, was circumcised according to the Torah and never was never ousted out of the land, right? There's a whole picture within Yitzhak you could take there. So it says, and it came to be after these events that Elohim tried Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take now, eth your son, eth your only son. This word right here, we'll get back to in just a minute, but it is the word yachid, which is very close to the word yachad. And we've talked about those. We'll go over it again, but that is a very significant word. All of that's part of this parable here. Okay. So he says, take now Aleph Tal, your son, eth your only son whom you love, eth Yitzach. And go to the land of Moriah, or Moriah, I'm sorry, and offer him there as an ascending offering on one of the mountains which I command you. And remember, the ascending offering is also known as the whole burnt offering that is completely consumed by fire, right? And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled Eth, his donkey, and took Eth, Two young men of his, Eth, with him, and Eth, Yitzach, his son, and he split the wood for the ascending offering, and arose and went to the place which Elohim had commanded him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted Eth, his eyes, and saw Eth, the place, from a distance. And this is another word that we want to take a look at here because the that doesn't mean necessarily the place. So Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey while the boy and I go over there and worship and come back to you. Remember, these are parables and this is all about what our Mashiach was doing if you, if you're paying attention. What the donkey represents, the two witnesses, right? Everything here. <clears throat> and Abraham took the wood, there might be an Aleph there, of the ascending offering and laid it on Yitzhak, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And Yitzhak spoke to his father and said, My father... And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, See the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for an ascending offering? 
And Abraham said, My son, Elohim does provide. That word for for isn't in the Hebrew there. It says, Elohim does provide himself the lamb for an ascending offering, which was the foretelling of the advent of our Mashiach as the lamb of Elohim. If you recall the first mention right here. Other than what you can see in the stars. And the two of them went together and they came to the place for or the place which Elohim commanded him, and Abraham built a slaughter place there, and placed Aleph Tal, the wood, in order. And he bound Aleph Tal Yitzach, his son, and laid Eth him on the slaughter place upon the wood. And I believe the wood right here should also have the Aleph Tal. I'll have to double check. But again, all of these things, every one of the Aleph Tal, yeah, there's the wood there, it's significant. It's what is his, what belongs to him, what's offered to him, the things in regard to him. But it's not over everything. I don't know if it was consistently used throughout the, the scriptures accurately, but you can see it more in the original covenant times and writings. Two examples, Edom has the Aleph Tal before his name until he sells his birthright, of which then it is removed. And then Ruth, the Moabitess, does not have the Aleph Tal before her name until she is betrothed to and uh, married to Boaz there and becomes a partaker of the covenant. So it's definitely more to look into there. So it says right here, and the two of them went together, and they came to the place which Elohim had commanded him. And Abraham built a slaughter place there and placed Eth the wood in order. And he bound Eth Yitzach his son and laid Eth him on the slaughter place upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out Eth his hand and took Eth the knife to slay Eth his son. Yet the messenger of Yahuwah, and remember, that of is not always there. It's never there that I'm aware of written in the Hebrew on the way it's meant to be with a sere yod, denoting whatever of. But um, they use it because sometimes it is not our Mashiach speaking. It is an actual messenger. In this instance, it's our Mashiach who appears and speaks to him. And you can find that unequivocally in the way the text speaks here. And then how it is revealed in the book of Yobelim. Because the messenger of the presence who is dictating the words of the book of Yobelim to Moshe and writing them down to give to him. He's the one that says, and I was the one speaking to Abraham here, saying, and I myself do these things. So, And that was our Mashiach talking to Moshe, the one whom... Elohim told all the people, or told Moshe and or Aharon and Miriam, when they reviled Moshe for having a Ethiopian wife. He says, "Of foretellers and 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 seers and things, I speak to them in dreams and visions. But Moshe, I speak to face to face, as a man speaks to his friend." And that was our Mashiach literally the one that was in the burning bush, the voice of Elohim, Debar Yahuwah, the word of Elohim that walked in the garden, physically there speaking face to face with Moshe that he did not want the others to perceive him lest they die. Right? And, the, and that's who you'll see here. But you can just, and you can see it from the text itself and then it's even more clear when you have the second witness to confirm it in the book of Yobelim. <clears throat> It says, yet the messenger Yahuwah called to him from the Shemaim and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy, nor touch him. For no, or sorry, for now, I know that you fear Elohim, seeing you have not withheld your son, Eth Yachidka, your, your only son, 
from me. And Abraham lifted Eth his eyes and looked and saw behind him, probably Aleph Tau there, I'm sorry, a ram caught in the bush by its horns. Okay, the crown of thorns that was caught on his horns. If that that's a type of the crown of thorns for the leader of the flock, like a ram. And the horns represent the authority, which was bound up in the thorns. If you guys know what thorns means, all of this is pictures of the truth. That's why the crown of horn, the thorns was smacked on his head when he was mocked too. And then another reference to this type of image is in Yonah when he's swallowed up in the belly of the beast or the, the whale there or the sea monster. And he has the reeds around his head. But he says, and he caught, or and he, he's behind him, and he saw a ram caught by, or in a bush by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for an ascending offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Yahuwah Yaira, as it is said this day. On the mountain of Yahuwah, or on the mountain, Yahuwah provides. And that's what Yaira means, all right? Yahuwah, our provider. And the messenger of Yahuwah called to Abraham a second time from the Shemaim and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahuwah. So this is this messenger saying by himself he sworn. And that's how we know that this is our Mashiach speaking. Because he's the one that swore the oath. He's the one that walked between the parts that were cut by Abram to make the covenant with the father. He's the one that gave the covenant to the children. And then he's the one that ratified that covenant with his own blood to return his wayward children by the, the death of the husband so that they can remarry. That's the whole picture there and what Shaul's talking about. But you don't, you don't have the son die because they had married the father to remarry the son. That, that's a perversity. The father was never married with his creation. The son is the bridegroom. All right. <clears throat> and this is the same thing you read in Revelation. But a lot of people, when they see Yahuwah, they think that is only ever the father's name and no one else can be spoken of here, right? But the father, who is the only true Elohim, whom no one is greater or equal to, to whom no one can comprehend, is not limited by a body or in any capacity. His son is, is not equal to him. He is limited. He has a body. He, he is not, he's not infinite. He had a beginning. He died and rose again. He will live forever after. But these are not equal to the Almighty. However, Scripture is very clear. He inherited the name above every name because of his obedience. Because what if he freely chose to do of his own will? He was called the firstborn and the son. He was given the Father's name, and it was his pleasure, the Father's pleasure, to create all things through his son, who is called Yahuwah after his father. Right? When you have that comprehension, nothing is contradictory. Nothing is awkward. Everything makes sense. The things that were confusing, like in Yeshayahu, where it says, Before me there was no El formed, and after me there is none. I, even I, am Yahuwah, and apart from me there is no Savior. That cannot be the Father, because the Father was never formed. Right? And then the one who says, um, Before me there are... There's, I am the first and I am the last, and apart from me there is no Elohim. That is the Father, meaning he is the beginning. He is before all things, and he is the end of all things. And apart from him, meaning beside him, there is no other power and authority. But because of him, our Mashiach was created, and through him, Moshe was called an Elohim to Pharaoh. So these Elohim that are, are because of, or by 
the one who truly is, just like it says. And that that verse there, identifying the Father, is explicitly mentioned by Kepha in the Recognitions of Clement from Book 3, Chapters 1 through 10, which is a refutation. It's, it's, it's refuting the idea of the Christian Trinity before it was ever in existence. I highly recommend looking at these things. And you don't have to go beyond the, the scriptures if you just take it for what it really says and don't let anyone try to tell you what it means. Go for what it actually means, right? So back on point. This messenger Yahuwah says, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahuwah, because you have done F this, which is another word I want to look at, right? Another translation says, because you have done this thing, right? And have not withheld F your son, F Yachidka, or your only begotten, that I shall certainly barak you and shall certainly increase your seed as the stars of the Shamayim and as the sand which is on the seashore. This has a multitude of meanings real, real quick. I'll give you the two that are the most prevalent. Because Abraham was obedient and, and offered up his son, Yahuwah was going to have his sons or his children be like the stars in multitude and what it represented, the one who was going to come and be the offering, right? And not be withheld because you can't outgive your maker. And if one was willing to do this for him, he was literally going to do it for him and for his children after him. He re, he he cannot outgive him. But that's the foretelling. That's the the promise in this. And then it's also showing that his seed would be numerous, like the stars of the Shamayim, which are the lights in the darkness. They guide those navigating the waters. I mean, think about what stars do. They show forth him who names them. They know him who numbers them. The meanings of the stars bring forth the gospel, they call it, which I never use that word. I use the good news, but the it's called the gospel in the stars, the witness in the stars. There's a lot of books and information. The Maseroth by Francis Rolston is another one that talk about that very phenomenon. And then the sand, which is by the seashore. The sand is the barrier between the waters, what you're guided by uh, navigating in a ship on the stars, and the dry land, which can, or the land which compels all men to dry out. Okay, that's the border. The sand is the distinction between what is of death and the and the waters and and those that foam up their own shame and are stopped at the barriers. And there's a whole picture there. And then what is allowed on the land? the breath of life, man who's indwelled with reason. So the borderline is his children, the ones who make that distinction, and the stars. All literally true, all, all part of what this promise is about. You can't just pick one thing and say, well, that's it, because it, it's more than that. Just like a, he a word in Hebrew has more than just a basic meaning when you look at it, right? So here's the promise. We'll continue it. It says, and let your seed possess the gate of their enemies. Because of the obedience of what Abraham did here, this was going to happen because it's reciprocal. You have to keep in mind what that is and actually what it means when you think about it. And the last part is, and in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be Baruch because you have obeyed my voice. Literally, in our Mashiach, the promised seed, all nations of the earth were Baruch or shall be Baruch. And literally, in his descendants, the birthright covenant people, all the nations were Baruch because it was his children. It was the culmination of Ephraim and Manasseh there, Britain and America that evangelized the world and brought the good news to every nation during those times. And they were greatly prospered at that time. And that's when the veil was starting to be lifted, when the fullness of the nations of the Melohagoyim was happening. 
what we call the uh, the the British Empire was coming to its fullness there. All right. This is then. So um, my point is that's also it's multi. It's our Mashiach, and it's literally his body, the literal birthright covenant people that brought the good news, just like he did. That was the Baraka to the nations of the earth. So I'm willing you can see that because there was a time where not everyone knew it, but there is not generally a place in the world today that is not familiar with the, the story in the scriptures, which is why the entire world is coming under judgment for rejecting the truth given to them. So real quick, it says that Abraham returned to his young men and they rose up and went together to Beersheba or Beersheba, the well of the oath, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And it came to be after these events that it was reported to Abraham, saying, See, Milcah too has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uts his firstborn, and Booz his brother. And these all have Aleph Taus, by the way. I, I, I didn't get to add these in, but they're generally, they separated from the idolatry. And they had went out with him, but they did not continue, okay? The ones that they could go get wives from them, they had to leave off their mother and father, break off and go join them in the land, just like Abraham separated from his family to join the covenant. Everyone at that time had to do the same. Every woman that married did that when they came in with them. Yitzhak's wife, Yaakov's wives, okay? Louis's wife he brought from their same picture and type. And in the same way, um, when they were to bring them in from outside, they had to have them separated and then bring them into the covenant. You can see another witness for that in the ancient history of Caldonia. Before they were given the Torah, they had what they followed the laws of the altar, which was the, the, the rules and injunctions given in the writings before the time of Moshe, the book of Hanok or what we call Enoch the first-hand account writings of Lemek, Noah, possibly others, Abram, and Yaakov, and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs were all the writings that they would have been familiar with. And they had laws or rules that they lived by based off of the words and the injunctions of their ancestors. Before they would let any of their women marry a, a Greek, for example, for the the people of the Troy, the Hebrews that lived there, they required him to spend seven years offering offerings to Yahuwah, the El of Bethel only, and not any other things, and showing works worthy of, or meet of, for repentance, following the laws of the altar. And after the seven years, then they were allowed to marry him once they were circumcised, but making sure they were walking right, then doing right, and then allowed to do so. Same kind of thing. It says, Booz his brother and Kumiel, the father of Aram, and Chesed, or Chesed, and Chazo, and Pildash, and Lidf, Yidlaf, and Bethuel, and Bethuel brought forth Ribka. These eight Milka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Reu. Riruma also bore Tevach and Gecham and Techash and Ma'aka. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So it's it's giving a little bit of the the genealogy for the cousins, if you will, the relations of Abram and his children. These are the people who became known as the Syrians or the Arameans during the time of Dawid, when you had the Arameans or the Syrians that would join with Assyria to fight against Dawid or the children, it was the children of Nahor, right? The, the children of Laban and his their, their relations where they had said they would not go beyond Gilad, which we'll get to. We haven't read that part yet here, but they make a covenant with Yaakov and Laban that they would not cross a certain point with evil intent toward the other. And every time one of them did that, they fell to the other and were had problems because of it. 
most often you see that in the uh, Arameans falling under the hand of Dawid because they were joining with the Assyrians and things like that. So real quick, I want to ask you guys, is there any, let me pause it real quick. Okay, so real quick, before we wrap up, I wanted to show you if I can remember those few words. Um, like the word for Ella, how it means a terebinth or a tree, an oath. When you look at other words, like here's a word for the wood for, etza. And etz is really a tree. Etza is to take counsel. So there, there's a lot more involved, and there's other words that you can look at. The, the Hebrew is an amazing thing. Right here, itu, right? Ito, ito, that's with, Aleph, Tau, they translate as with, and then him. That's the part where I had the Aleph, Tau, with him there. Okay. Sometimes in the Masoretic text, you don't see it here. But sometimes you'll have a word that is doubled. I believe this one is because they have um, a variety of spellings. They have the kitovim and the the kirabim and the kitovim. They say how it is written and how it is pronounced. And the, the reason why they do that, they came up with. Or, I didn't get sorry, that. Could I'm you try sure. again? The reason why they did that is because in the language, as you're reading the scriptures, it would have the wrong verb tense, or it would be spelt in a way that it wouldn't make sense grammatically in the natural progression of just speaking normally. But normally, almost always when that happens, because it's significant, he's foretelling something with the use of that verb or the use of that tense. There's something meaningful to it because he does nothing without purpose. And our Mashiach said there would be, there's not a yod, which in the modern Hebrew, the yod is the smallest letter, but in the paleo, it's the working hand or the tittle. So there's nothing that he's working and not even the smallest deviation of a little mark that will be changed until he's accomplished everything. I can't really agree with, you know, saying that just because it's spelled one way, that's not right. We're going to change it. Now, I don't know if it was originally that way, and I can't tell you exactly what the first manuscripts actually said, because we weren't there, but the reality is, it is that way. That is the truth. This is what we have, and we have to deal with that based on what he said, and when you put what he said and, and the way things walked out, he was abused by his own before handing over to Rome, and then you see what happened to his words, you see that it reflects the truth. And he foretold these things in the very way he walked out his Passion Week, even. <laughs> All right. Um, that word for the place, eth, the place, right, is ham mikom. Ham ma koum, they say, but ham, ham ma kom. Kom, like the comb on a rooster's head, is to stand. Literally what it means in Hebrew. And that's where we get that word on a rooster's head from, kom. Makom is the means or the place of standing. And then ham makom is the place of standing. And you can see right here, uh, with now that we look at a standing place, makom. They have that to mean an area, right? A country a direction because it's a place that's standing it's already established and a country is an an area is a an established space so you can see where they get these words for that word but it doesn't just mean place it's and he saw Aleph Tal the standing place or the the place of which to stand from a distance and when you have that just like all these other places and the real meanings, then it makes the parable, the idea of our Mashiach, the Aleph Tal, that is the lamb being brought by the hand of the father and offered by his will at his consent, all about him. 
And it's all foretold in the very story right here and stamped with him over and over and over and over again. Even that he was going to be put upon the wood, right, is right here. It's not mentioned in every place, but it's literally when he put him up upon the wood, right? So um, here's another one I thought was interesting. Hamat Akalet, the Akol, Akol is to eat. The means of eating is with a knife or utensil. So, right, that's just a simple one. But um, I can't remember if there was another one. I think there might be some. We'll have to get it another time. However, yeah, there's the wood here. See, there's more. The altar was his. The wood was his. The lamb was marked as his. The hand was his of Abraham, right? And his son. Everything is like stamped with Aleph Tau here, all foretelling his passion at the Passover. And again, this was one of the things that while it was walked out, one of the last things that he instituted is the festivals. It happened as one of the first things with the exodus and the deliverance of his children. And that's another type of those inversions that I was talking about, a foreshadow of what would come. So with that, I think I've uh, <laughs> given you quite a bit of information. Ob willing, it's not too confusing, and it will be very beneficial to whoever hears it. I, I Especially if you take it and you try to prove these things for yourself. So until then, you have a wonderful Shabbat, have a great Shavuot Tov, and we will see you next time. Sorry about that. I was just kidding. One of my friends here just reminded me we forgot a word, and it's literally all over the place here, but I'll get back to it. Um, He says that you have not denied your only son from me. It says, Aleph Tal Binka. Right, your son, the cough is your Ben. It's literally Aleph Tal, son of yours, right? Aleph Tal Yahid Yahid Ka Yahid Ka. Okay, the Yahid is only begotten and the Ka is yours. That word right there is the word used for the only begotten, always in reference to our Mashiach or your only son, as in reference to Yitzhak, and also in reference to Yaakov. Even though Edom was born of the womb with him, he was the Yechad, or the Yechid bent, the only brought forth. And um, you can see where it's used here. I highly encourage you to look at this. It's always about our Mashiach. It's always talking about the only begotten when this word is used. And then the connection. The kicker here that is amazing is when you get rid of that yod in the middle, that working hand, you have the word yachad. And that word, if I can find it here at all, it is the word that we say means one, where or it is sharpened in the Proverbs when it says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens Here's that yachdav, right? Yachad is the origin here. There we go. But it is to be united into one. Yachad. So yachid is the only begotten, but we as his body are to be yachad or united into one. One body, one mind, one being, one head, one law, one Elohim, one Mashiach. And an agreement in these things is to be Yachad. That is the only begotten. That is the beloved of the Father. And that is what we are to be as his body, united into one. And when you look up the word Yachad here, it's used, like I said, it's there in Genesis there. It's mentioned in the Psalms. It's mentioned in the Proverbs. Um, it is also uh, like Psalm 133 is how tob and how pleasant it is for brothers to be to dwell together in unity that is gam yachad right 
all about the, and then it says the precious oil on the head, the, the head of Aharon running down the beard onto the collar of his robe. And that's like the dew on the Mount Hermon, or the, the place of the covenant. It's all about our Mashiach is our head, Aharon, the exalted mountain, the anointing oil poured out on him first, running down onto the beard. The Zakim or Zakanim is the elders. That's the word for beard. The bearded ones are the elders. And then onto the collar of his robe. The robe is the one, the, the garment that is made without seam that was not broken or divided, meaning his body. And that is talked about in, I believe, Hippolytus's refutation of all heresies, where he talks about that very uh, parable and how that relates to our Mashiach in that capacity. But in the same way, we are to be Yechad, and that is what brings forth the Yechid, right? Just like we had mentioned earlier, I've talked about it before, and my brother was asking just before we started recording, what does it take for him to return? What is he waiting for? What did it take for the millennial reign type and shadow to be about with the kingdom during the time of Dawid and Shalomo? Was it not repentance, acknowledgement of the sins of ourselves and our fathers and turning from them? It's exactly what it took, and he doesn't change. So now uh, with that being said, you all have a wonderful Shabbat, a great week ahead, and we'll see you next time.